All right, well, hello everybody. And uh, um, thank you very much for, for joining us. It's uh, um, nighttime here in, in the East Coast where even and I are and uh, Phoebe as well. So, so thank you for, for joining us for our um, weekly session on climate education through the worldwide teaching on climate and justice. I'm David Blackstein and I am the co-director of the Worldwide Teaching on Climate and Justice, which is brought to you through the graduate programs at sustainability at Bard College. So even why don't you introduce yourself and, and we'll, we'll go around and have everybody introduce ourselves and then begin with our, our, our speakers here. I mean, as, as David indicated, um, we're working together on this project. Um, I am the director of the graduate programs in sustainability at Bard in New York, um, and um, uh, we'll be talking more about the project um, this evening. And I'll pass it over to uh, to Phoebe if she's here with us. Phoebe, would you like to just just introduce yourself briefly here? We'll we'll, we'll get to the the presentations uh, shortly, but just introduce yourself briefly if you can. Maybe we're still having audio trouble. Well, why, why don't we turn to, yeah, she's connecting to audio, so hopefully she'll get that working. Susan, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Um, my name's Susan Merritt, and currently I'm teaching at UC Santa Cruz. Taught a couple classes in, um, in climate and environmental justice related topics and on a couple committees system wide and local with with my campus um, that have to do with uh, climate change and solutions. Um, kind of blanking out here, I've been grading all day. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And Susan, were you, were, were you, were you involved in the uh, Santa Cruz uh, teaching in, in uh, um, March or April? Or, sorry, I April would, no, I just I just came here uh, for the fall. Ah, okay, great. No, um, yeah, just just came here in the fall, and um, but there's there's a lot of activity, and uh, we just hosted. Um, I had nothing to do with this, but a lot of my students and I attended um, a student organized climate change conference here on campus, and it was pretty remarkable. So, um, oh, yeah. Great. That's who I am. Okay, great. And Stephanie, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephanie Mungia. Um, I am based in Miami, Florida, where I'm a current PhD student at Florida International University. Um, but I'm also here more in my capacity as a student engagement manager for Citizens Climate Lobby. Oh, great. Good. Well, we've we've done some things with CCL, but we're always eager to do more. So. Uh... Yeah, likewise. Great. All right. And uh, Phoebe, are you, uh, let, let's see if your audio is working now, if you want to try to introduce yourself now. Uh, you're, 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 you're muted. So, oh, it looks like, oh, okay. Something with the phone connection here is, There, there's there's a uh, a mute sign through your phone. Um, okay, let me there you go. You okay, now. yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, hi everybody. Sorry, I don't know why the audio doesn't work. I don't, I don't know. Um, but uh, I'm Phoebe Godfrey. I'm a sociology professor. Focuses on climate change, sustainability, food. Uh, social theory, and do, do, I do so from an intersectional social justice lens. So nice to be here. Great. Well, thank you for, for being with us. And uh, Gillian, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. I'm Gillian Bowser from Colorado State University. Um, I'm an associate professor in ecosystem science and sustainability. 
We teach, we have um, a joint class that's funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, there are 10 universities involved. It's called the Youth Environmental Alliance in Higher Education. So we teach a joint class and then we also take students to the COP. This year, we, I think we're a little bit too ambitious. We have a total of something close to 60 students and I think we're all looking kind of cross-eyed still. Wow. <laughs> so I'm not sure that we've recovered yet. <laughs> and a couple of people got COVID on top of it. So we're all kind of in the oh, no. <laughs> um, But happy to talk more about that experience. All right. Wow, okay. And uh, well, um, Natalie, or, I'm sorry, NT, um, would you like to introduce yourself please? Thank you, Nat Trumbull, University of Connecticut. Um, tuning in at, at least to say hello to Phoebe and uh, we'll be listening with great interest. Huh? Okay, well, thanks for joining us, Nat. So Ian, why don't you um, start and give us a little bit of an overview of the uh, world I teach in just to provide some context here and then we'll turn to Gillian right. and, and Phoebe to talk about their experience uh, with students at the COP. All right, so a message from your sponsor. Um, um, so um, the project that Dave and I have been working on actually for four years now is really trying to promote uh, coordinated climate education among high schools, and universities, faculty around the world. Um, and uh, the, the goal obviously is, you know, at this moment, um, we really need to uh, actually, I was I was in Kyrgyzstan um, a, a couple of weeks ago and and had a, a professor that suggested a very good exercise, which is, you know, think about where we all are on a scale of one to ten uh, around climate, and we're probably around an eight. Um, and uh, and our students are typically or often at a one or a two, um, not because they don't understand the magnitude of the problem, but they don't really see what the issues what they can do about it. And so rather than sort of engage and despair, they are disengaged. Um, so, uh, and at the same time, increasingly, our fellow faculty members are moving up the scale from, you know, a two or a three to a five or a six. And, at, you know, at every college, university, and high school in the world, um, you know, 50, 60, and 80% of the faculty are probably deeply climate concerned, even if they're not climate experts. So what we've been trying to do is figure out an on-ramp for those people to talk about climate change with their students from a disciplinary perspective so that psychologists can talk about climate psychology and economists can talk about how economists are thinking about climate change and a historian can talk about how historians are, are incorporating climate change into what they're thinking about with the intent of really engaging students beyond the 30 or so who would typically show up for a you know, an event that you hosted on your campus um, with the idea of engaging with climate in their careers and becoming climate economists or climate psychologists or climate chemists uh, or climate artists or climate communicators. Um, because we need that army, uh, that, that, that global community of, of problem solvers. So that's really what we're trying to accomplish through the worldwide teaching is to take the conversation across campus by mobilizing climate concern faculty, not the usual, you know, climate focused faculty, but the climate concern faculty to engage a, a much broader audience of students. So I'm going to give a brief overview now and we'll, we'll talk more about it um, at the end of the conversation tonight. Um, and so here's our website, the worldwide teach in on climate and justice. And um, if you scroll down here, we have a nice one minute video right here. Um, there's a longer 10 minute video that talks about what we do. But the main thing here is this register your event button. So if you are planning to do any kind of climate education at your university, um, please uh, in the spring, please register that event. If you click on that button, you will get this page popping up, which is our lovely interactive map um, and you can see we've got about a hundred events registered at this point around the world uh, we want to get a thousand by uh, by March 29th um, and we'd like to engage a million students uh, 500,000 to a million students 
at those thousand institutions. So help us out, um, and we'll talk more about how that can happen uh, after our presenters uh, are, are done tonight. But, you know, now is the time, you know, you're all here tonight because you're deeply concerned. This is a, an easy way to sort of amplify the power of climate education on your campuses. And we'll, we'll talk more specifically about strategies um, in a few minutes. So David, back over to you. We can see if there's any questions before we get started, or let's dive into the conversations about climate and COP. Yeah, so so I guess before um, we turn to the, the COP, are, are there any um, questions for Eve about the teaching? We can circle back to, to it as well. If, if you have, you know, <laughs> this is a small group, so just uh, um, unmute yourself and talk if, if you wanna ask a question now or, or, or later. I have a question. Please, maybe, yeah. So um, when, when does the theater go on the website? Yeah, even I, 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 you missed your cue to talk about that. So with Phoebe's help, one of the things we've done this year is we've sponsored a, a, a climate uh, a playwriting contest. And we have about, I think, 40 applicants at this point for five minute plays. We are going to find the best of those and uh, put them up on our website. Um, and the idea is as part of your climate teaching, you can reach out to some student theater folks and have them produce, you know, through four of those plays over the course of an hour with time in between for discussion. So we've got a lot of really interesting and sort of, uh, you know, uh, sort of so theater, comedy, uh, we've got an interesting climate game that just came across my desk. So lots of ideas that don't involve you know, students attending a lecture um, uh, to be we, part of your climate teaching. So answer your question, maybe January 15 is the day when we hope to have the plays okay. up there. And um, I actually have just reached out to the head of our theater program, uh, and I've got a meeting with her next week to um, figure out, you know, who are the students that we're going to reach out to, to sort of organize this for for our as part of our teaching so it's exciting great we we just had five plays last night and those those five are getting submitted excellent uh, the, for, for the end of the course society and climate change we uh i think we had about 20 people in the audience so that was pretty good uh, okay yeah good good stuff good. Good, good. All right. Well, we will, like I say, that'll be, uh, we'll be in touch, Phoebe, about reading those plays too and making, doing the judging. Yeah. Uh, pretty soon. Yeah. And thank you for all your help with that. So why don't, why don't we turn to the, the, the uh, um, advertised uh, topic here. Um, so Gillian, would, would you like to go first? And uh, you, you briefly uh, gave, gave us a little teaser, but uh, talk about sort of what, what brought you to the conference? Who, who, who you brought to COP and uh, both your experience and then sort of thoughts in terms of how um, education is playing into those kinds of discussions and what, what are some of the implications of those discussions for those of us in education? Um, sure, uh, but by the way, it looks like um, screen sharing is disabled. Um, oh, even yeah. if you can make her a co-host, she can, just yeah. FYI on that. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry, Phoebe, I didn't catch what institution you're at. I'm at UConn. Oh, okay, because UConn is one of our partners. So, yes, I, I feel I saw you there, but I, there are so <laughs> many people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we work with Mark Urban. In the, he's in biology and his specialty is limnology and hydrology. Okay. Okay, so he's been there for many years. So, um, oops, no, it's still disabled for me. Sorry. And he had, a, you, he, had a, he had a cohort at, um, there was quite a cohort at of University of Connecticut it was at the conference and they'd been there for several years. Um, and that's actually kind of fun. Um, so yeah, we took 14 here. Could you try sharing again? Yeah, I'm sure I'll try again. Nope, it still says Maybe disabled. Hmm. All right. Okay. Try it now. Oh, okay. Now something just flashed. Okay. There we go. 
Okay, I hope we, everyone can see. Yep, yep. My screen. <laughs> so I thought, <laughs> I, so I, thought I would. I thought I would just start with that, and maybe we can sort of just walk through some explanations. And um, since we have our colleagues from University of Connecticut, where they they know their connections, um, it might just be a useful starting place. So we're called the YEA, the Youth Environmental Alliance in Higher Education. Um, and so the Royal We is about 10 institutions that submitted a National Science Foundation Research Coordination Network grant in undergraduate biology education or an RCNEBE. And what that grant looks at is our, our real focus is uh, twofold. One on providing our students and, and, and probably predominantly our students in Colorado State, but also the other institutions a multicultural experience in um, global environmental negotiations. We want them to be able to see cultural perspectives in the environmental debate. Um, we tend to get uh, a lot of the main institutions, our students have very little experience working in a highly diverse bodies. Um, and to sort of just get a sense of what that looks like at a COP is so important. It's very important for us, the students to get to the COP and to see that firsthand. Our second goal is that we use the sustainable development goals as a teaching platform. And part of that platform is, and it's had ups and downs, I'll be quite honest, and it's this finals week, so we're probably all a little bit on the downside of things. Um, but you know, using the sustainable development goals, we, we create cross-institutional teams for each of the sustainable development goals. And those students write a project or develop a project and presentation that they take to the COP. And part of the goal is, is we want them to bring it home, so to speak. So here's the sustainable development goals. Here's the international framework. This is all great and gravy, but what does it mean back home? So you bring your climate action back home to what we're doing within the United States. So the grant just sort of show up as you've got a couple of sort of kind of fun and exciting things. You talk about it, um, events. We just got a new NSF uh, grant supported through one of our network members who is creating the Climate Leaders Academy. And this is at Vanderbilt University with Leah Dundon is the lead PI on that portion of the grant. And the, most of the rest of us, we sort of seem like we take turns on who's in charge of which grant that we're trying to submit. Um, and the idea of the Leadership Academy is to provide a certificated, certificate based experience. So they would get a certificate after one year of, of remote classwork. Um, online classwork, and then they travel to the COP itself. The grant does two things, um, and Leo would be the one to, as we start, we just got this funding, so we're starting to launch it. Um, the grant does two things. One is that it pays the tuition for um, Vanderbilt University, so we can reach out to students from a variety of economic backgrounds, um, and there's not an issue of paying tuition, and they get this certificate back, and then we pay for their travel to go to the COP. Um, so that'd be COP28, would be the first COP that that um, cohort of students would actually go to. So that's pretty exciting. That's a brand new grant. Congratulations. Going, yeah, that was actually a fun one. Leah took the lead on that. Um, so here's our list of institutions that are engaged. Um, and I'm sure as many of you know, working on a, a research coordination network type of grant, your institutional membership changes and ebbs and flows and comes and goes and you get new ones and you get ones that are maybe not as active as they could be. Um, and you know, so it changes around. So this list is switched around a little bit. Brandis is our newest member. We worked at COP27 with uh, Yale University, Cornell University, and a couple of others. Um, so we hope to change this membership around. You see Montana Tech is another one of our newer universities here. So we currently have 12 universities listed, including two international universities, Monash University, University of Derby in UK, and then a uh, university who's not on here, um, because they were not active this year, is La Molina University in Lima, Peru. And so our goal really when we go to the COP is to give the students a space where they are participants and not just observers. And I would say in most cases that works fairly well. I think last year with this COP, A, it was the second largest COP on record ever. It was 50,000 participants um, jammed in a circular space. So you can just kind of imagine the chaos that went on. 
And I think this year our students got more lost than ever. Um, so this is always a challenge of the cops. So what we use the, why we use the SDG. So students present um, a project based on their local information or knowledge. Um, and they present that at the COP. And how we do that is the, of the leadership. We've, many of us have gone to many COPs. I've been to every COP since COP 15. And what we do is we, we submit for side events and press conferences and you know any one of these events where people can present and there are a pile of them. You know, some of them are UN sponsored events and some of them are pavilion sponsored events. So our students get in front of the audience and our goal has always been to get every student that we take to the COP has to present somewhere. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, press conferences are the, really the best. It's a great experience for them. Uh, they're short, sweet, to the point, um, and they're fairly easy to get. Some of the other events are really hard to, to get and very competitive to get a slot. And we find that giving them that centering, okay, you're gonna present on SDG5 on gender on this day, gives the students a purpose to try and navigate their way through the COPs, especially when the negotiations are really sticky or really complicated and, and it's hard for them to follow. So it gives them a purpose. So you, you find that they very often will run over to the pavilion sections or they'll be in civil society sections when they're totally lost in the negotiations. Um, and this year was classic because the primary negotiations were around loss and damage, um, more so in week two. And there's a lot of finance mechanisms and you know, we've got a lot of ecology students and they were just you know completely lost <laughs> on all these finance mechanisms being talked about talked around so that's kind of what we do we've been at this for a while um before we the grant did uh, we put together the, the grant in um, madrid we all met in madrid and said you know hey a bunch of us are bringing students to the cop let's why don't we work together on this and see if we can come up with some common metrics and ideas and this is where the Yay fellowship came together you'll see we have some resources um we hire students um as yay fellows and we're going to be putting out a call for yay fellows very soon and i'll talk to you in a hot second as to why that's kind of exciting and kind of real and let me see if i can find it on our website this is hosted by university of of michigan i'm uh, sorry michigan tech university is that part of our days we do this um global conference each year this was in april of last year and students present their individual research and we also archive it in the university library so it gets a doi number and all this nice stuff and they get a nice little publication it shows up on google scholar but again it's, it's a it's giving them a product to show um you know what their what what their their work was we also developed these modules um and part of what these modules do is that it gives a teaching module that we put together with slides and other resources that um, sits around each of the SDG. So we share this as we try and get the students started. This was actually written by students and the idea was to give them some way to sort of center on themselves. So you can see this is kind of centered around Colorado um, type approach. So then last thing I'll just sort of share real quick is that you know, our, our team, we try and be pretty diverse. Um, there are several from Colorado State University, Michigan, Sorry, Moravian University, Colorado College, um, Boston University, uh, University of California Scripps Institute, La Molina University, Scripps Institute again, Michigan Tech, Vanderbilt, Monash, and there's your colleague at um, University of Connecticut. We also have Indiana University, University of Derby, and Colorado College. Um, this website hasn't been updated with Brandeis yet. We're calling Hitchcock as the contact at Brandeis. And again, our sort of idea is to work together with different types of institutions. We have large R1 institutions, we have a couple of uh, predominantly undergraduate institutions, um, we have public institutions, we have private institutions, and you know, trying to work together so we can bring our students together and <clears throat> excuse me, um, give them an experience at the COP. What I was hoping to show you, what I'm not seeing, um, we did host a summit at COP26, which was all students, hosted by students, run by students um, in what's called the Action Hub. Um, they had um, basically sold out attendance when the hub filled the, the seats, I think it's at about 200 people. So it's completely full. And this sort of helped 
the students have their voice. They wrote the script and they did this. So this was not associated with the SDGs. And they told the title, they chose the title Youth as Voices of Optimism and Agents of Change. The other past event that we've done, which is not on here, um, for whatever reason, is we've been working with the National Climate Assessment. And, and David, I believe you've worked with them as well, the NCA5. Um, yeah, a long time ago, or maybe not that long ago, but yeah, earlier, yeah. Yeah, previous one, yeah. So the NCA5, the National Climate Assessment is underway right now. Um, and what we've been working on is how do we get youth voice into this national climate assessment? So we hosted a youth dialogue um, before the public comment period for the first draft closed in January. And we had over 300 youth from all of the US attend. And that was really awesome. So we're gonna host a second dialogue on the national climate assessment. So this is the final draft. Um, and we're hoping you know, for a similar attendance. And the idea is to give a youth a voice in the climate assessment process within the United States, help them tie that to the climate assessment process that's going on worldwide, and to see how, you know, something like the COP, how all these pieces kind of move together. So we were really pleased with the last youth dialogue and it was really good attendance. We'll see what this youth dialogue looks like. So I don't know if you want me to sort of stop, take a deep breath and get some questions and maybe see what some other thoughts are and we can talk more about how we actually teach this class in a bit. Yeah, why, why don't we stop for that and and, and just, I'm, I'm kind of kicking myself here saying, uh, you know, how come I haven't connected with you and, and reached out earlier in, in our time working on the teaching because there's so much in common. And I remember when you were first uh, writing those RCN that ran. So anyway, we can we can find ways to, to collaborate, but the, let's, and, and Phoebe has rejoined us now, I think by phone. Um, so let, let's see if there's any um, questions or comments to Gillian, and then uh, um, we'll, we'll turn to, to Phoebe if, if, if she can get her, her phone connection to work. So any, any anything for, for, for Gillian about uh, the, this uh, exciting project. And, and Gillian, when you get a chance, please uh, pop the link into the chat and uh, we will share that not only with the people here, but with the uh, people who registered and who attended this morning who uh, um, will be able to watch this by video. So I, I guess, um, yeah, thanks, Gillian. So I, I guess one question that I have is with all of the students that you have brought um, to these COPs over the past decade and, and through these various coordinating networks, what kind of um, follow-up do you have with the students beyond when, when they're actively in the program? Do you have any sort of alumni community? Do you have any sense of what the impact of this experience is on the students and what, what they're doing now? I, I know that you have a lot of students, but uh, curious about that. Um, sort of yes and no. So there is a evaluator um, assigned to the project with NSF. And so we, we run pre and post surveys fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the evaluators must be taking a look at those surveys and seeing, you know, what sort of trends emerge and, um, you know, to help inform us with our next steps. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that's kind of a mix. I think the, I would say you end up with two groups of students um, after, of all the years, I still think there's still about two groups of students. Group A is the group that loves chaos, do well in <laughs> chaos. They can survive the craziness. They don't mind standing on long queues to get into a room to listen on some obscure topic that you can barely follow. Um, and and they, they have the patience to sit because diplomacy is word by word and it's slow and it's tedious and it's important to catch each of these different words. And then I think of the second group of students, the ones who tend to be a little bit more schedule oriented um, for want of a better word that, mm -hmm. They get 
they get lost when they realize that the daily program for the cop actually does change every single day. Um, and there's no way to get ahead of that change every single day. Mm -hmm. And and that the cop, they will schedule plenary at nine o'clock at night at 10 o'clock at night. I mean, it's, it's free for all as to when things are scheduled. And I find that some students really struggle with that. They, they ask, is there a daily agenda? And you have to say, no, there isn't. You just check the daily program every morning when you get up and see what mm -hmm. chaos has occurred the night before. Um, and I think part of it is that the negotiators and the students really come there on with different purposes. And right. the negotiators come there to get a year's worth of work crammed into two weeks and get something done. Mm -hmm. So it means the nine to five doesn't exist. People will be there all night. People, I mean, the last cop convened the plenary at 3 a.m. in the morning, which was interesting because you were all at the airport at that point, um, <laughs> and concluded at 9 a.m. the next mo the, the same morning. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and students complained about it. It's like, but this is, these, the delegates are trying to make the maximum use of their time to get a, a decision document. If that includes being up all night, it's what happened. The Paris Agreement was signed at 2 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. so I think you get those two populations of students. And I think the hardest challenge for us over the years is how do you prepare students for that so they can bring their own survival skills to play um, is, is probably the biggest challenge, even more than the content. It's the context that gets everybody out of whack. I mean, you can't find the plenary room. You get lost in the pavilion space. You can't figure out if this is a negotiation or discussion. This is open or if it's closed. All this stuff, I think, frustrates some students. And then they lose the the rhythm, for want of a better way of a cop. Mm -hmm. So I think as a teaching moment, thinking about how you bring students to the cop is more important than the content of the cop itself. Negotiations are hard to follow especially mm -hmm. for undergraduate students. However, in another colleague, and I'm positive I'm answering too long, another colleague, there's a blog post, and I forget the blog's name, I can look it up, um, compared the cop to a three ring circus. And I use this analogy because it, it's, it was so apt and it's so true. And the three rings are, um, one is negotiations, two is pavilion, and three is civil society. And the negotiation space is really where the meat and potatoes are. The pavilion space, I like to tell my students, is a bragging space. This is where countries brag about all the stuff that they thought they did, should have done, mm -hmm. want to do, claim to have done, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is where everybody brags. And countries spend a lot of money on these pavilions. The U.S. spent a couple of million on their pavilion. Hmm. And the idea of the pavilion is that you show off what you want to show off. You're in control of the pavilion. Civil society space is all everything on the fringes, um, which is side events, press conferences, you know, observer meetings, blah, 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 that runs in between these two other rings. And they don't always connect very well. And students tend to get lost in the pavilion ring and forget that this is not new data. This is people presenting existing data and there's not negotiation. So it's an interesting mix of when yeah. you bring students to think about the non-discipline problems of a student class, kind of like a study abroad. You know, you gotta think about the messy stuff, like, okay, how many can you cram into a vehicle? <laughs> <laughs> and not what their discipline is. And has anyone thought about the nearest laundry mat? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, and you, 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 you've taken enough uh, students camping that you, you, you know how to, uh, yeah, to, to, to manage we, we, that. We try our best. And, you know, we still get students who have an uh, earth shattering changing experience. One of, one of the students just I met with the other day, so it's like, okay, now I want to go into international negotiations. She was, she was a taxonomist the week before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And that's kind of fun, you know, it's like yeah. feeling her eyes had opened and she never thought that this space is something that she was interested in. Um, other students are like, oh my God, I'm never gonna do that again. Um, and they, sadly, I don't think get a good sense of just how difficult environmental negotiations are. And other students get the goal of our project, which is it never occurred to me why the country of Ecuador is representing the G77 plus China and why that matters. Or why is yeah. ADLAC, the Association of Latin American States, voting against the African Union states on what should be a fairly common issue? And just getting to understand where countries and cultures play a role in 
environmental positions, I think is the really core goal of what our grant tried to do. Cool. Well, let, let, let's turn to Phoebe. It, it, we, we at least have a phone number that I believe must represent you, Phoebe. So why don't you, yeah, I, know, I, I know you missed a lot of Gillian's presentation, but maybe you could talk about the experience that you and the students that you brought with you had the COP and uh, those who, who got to listen to both of them can, can maybe compare and contrast. Uh, yeah, I apologize. I lost connection and I can't get back into the Zoom because I don't have the link and then my phone died. So, uh, but I'm happy we can to hear talk you. on the phone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clear. So go ahead. Okay. And even just sent me the link. So, um, yeah, I didn't hear everything Jillian said, but uh, this was my first time taking students. Uh, I think as as you Jillian mentioned, uh, UConn has been seven times, and um, Mark Urban and Angie Seth as, as two main people who've taken students, both from the more from the quote unquote hard sciences. I really hate that word, but uh, and myself as a sociologist, uh, sort of having that introduction to the COP and. There's a lot of things I could could say about it that I, you know, I would like probably to say to UConn people first, but uh, I didn't think, uh, I think we could have done a little more to prepare students sociologically. I have done some study abroad work and taken students to Ethiopia. I myself was in the Peace Corps. Uh, I think a lot more could have been done on uh, global inequalities, uh, contextualizing, even Egypt, a lot of the, and I, I don't know if this was your experience, Jillian, a, a lot of the narratives around Egypt is, you know, yes, it, they have a very problematic government, but one of the things I said to students is per capita, we have mo more people in prison than Egypt. Uh, so just kind of keeping that in perspective, because there was a lot of uh, emphasis on this is a military state and this is a this state and, you know, which is all true, but helping the students see it in the context of a lot of that linking to colonialism, linking it to various geopolitical issues. Uh, so that would have been something, uh, if, you know, if I go again or if I'm involved, you know, really giving students the the social analysis. Um, same thing at, at the COP. I I was a little at odds. I'm I'm a lefty and I'm very uh, social justice oriented. So. I, there was often a little bit of push and pull with the students. Uh, colleagues were like, John Kerry is going to meet with us. Let's go see him. And I'm like, no, indigenous people are having a, a forum over in a hotel. Let's go there um, and come to the protest that's in the main center versus, you know, go to the, go to the bigger things. And, you know, both are good, but it, it the balance was tipping more to the establishment, and uh, I spent most of my time going to the protest, listening to uh, indigenous people from Amazon, Philippines, uh, people from Pakistan, people from Africa, people from, you know, and really listening to stories and going to very small things. I got a few students, there was a, an incredible play from a South African uh, theater company called Empa Theater that were, they were in the capacity building, capacity building room, uh, which was one of my favorite of, of the UN rooms. So it's a, it, it was the only one that had aspects of interaction, trying to get the audience to engage and talk. Uh, so I got five students to go to, to the performance and uh, the theater group uses Ethno theater, so they do interviews, and and this is something I I'm going to do next year when I teach climate change and youth theater again. I have students do interviews, take those interviews and turn them into composite characters, then share them back with you know people in the community, uh, which is what this theater company did. They interviewed people up and down one of the coasts of South Africa in terms of their perceptions of the ocean. Uh, in response to seismic blasting that is going to be taking place or was going to be taking place. It's not totally clear because the play played a role 
uh, in a court decision that favored, uh, at the moment, a stay on the seismic blasting. And that was really powerful uh, for, you know, for the students that, oh, my God, theater can have an impact on a court decision. Um, so those kind of things, there was a, only one panel on militarism. I got several students to go to that. Again, mainly activists, people uh, on the fringes and speaking mostly about US military involvement around the world. Uh, again, from my critical perspective, there's no solution to climate change until we address US militarism uh, and incredible amount of money we spend on it. Uh, and all of that. So, so those were sort of ways that I tried to influence the students and bring a kind of a balance in terms of, of who are you listening to, whose knowledge uh, is seen as, as uh, important. Um, I brought a student to the Climate Justice Pavilion and uh, that influenced some of her work. Uh, tomorrow, we're, no, tomorrow is Thursday, Friday, there's the Climate Cafe where the students present their work to the community. And I'm excited to see, you know, those who are bringing more of an intersectional analysis and a social justice and talking about indigenous people. I mean, most of the indigenous people or small scale farmers are calling all of the proposals from the top false solutions. Um, and one of the things that you know, the students and I were really struggling with is so much of the quote unquote green energy, this 100% oh, green energy, da, 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 whatever, uh, is going to be extracted on indigenous lands, is going to require increased deforestation, is going to require more species to go extinct so we can have, you know, quote unquote, more energy and nothing is touching our consumption. Uh, so I encourage students to read, maybe you guys have read it, uh, Jason Hickel's book, Less is More, uh, and how degrowth, there was one session on degrowth, and that was actually at the, at the German pavilion on the very last day. Myself and another faculty went to it, uh, and it, it wasn't quite where we wanted it to be, but the, uh, conversations around degrowth, sharing that with students, kind of imagining a world without capitalism as we know it. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, it, it is a really educational experience to have students there um, and give them that privilege and opportunity to see people from around the world. I mean, really unbelievable levels of, of uh, voices. Uh, but again, within that, there's always the hierarchies of, you know, like I said. So, so that, was, that was my experience and i um, happy to discuss it. All right, thank you, Phoebe, very much. So are there questions or comments for, for Phoebe who uh, um, had, you know, come, you know, we all come with our, our different perspectives. And, and so, and, and looking at this multifaceted three ring circus and uh, seeing and experiencing some other things. So questions or comments for, for Phoebe, or if you want to circle back to Gillian with anything. I mean, I thought, you know, just overall, this sort of, you know, the students are really being thrown into what's more of a giant kind of trade show slash conference than a climate negotiation, right? Um, and I think that's what COP is becoming, right? It's sort of just the place where everybody who's concerned about climate change goes every year against a backdrop of sort of negotiations that, you know, are... Uh, you know, predicated on consensus and um, with, without sort of uh, a, a lot of teeth just by virtue of the construct. Um, and just, yeah. That, sorry, I mean, just going to jump in and dis to, to slightly disagree. Um, you need civil society there. That's the purpose of the UN. It, it has to be there. And I think the pressure the going pressure of attending the COP is so important. Even if the negotiators are not always in the pavilion spaces, they're exposed to the pavilion spaces. And, and, and I think it's important to keep that in mind, that, that you need to see that the, the Three Ring Circus does need to exist. It needs to be a chaotic because the globe needs to be involved. It shouldn't be a closed audience of just a handful of folks. 
it, it should be a place to celebrate accomplishments. It should be a place to protest accomplishments, whether it's just negotiators having to walk past those protests in the center hall every morning. So in COP23, sorry, COP24, if I get my numbers right, 23 in Bonn, Germany, um, they actually split what's called the green zone from the, green, from the blue zone. So all the civil society space was mm -hmm. about a mile down the road. And it changed the tone, it changed the engagement. I think you need that sort of chaotic engagement to make sure we don't lose track of civil society. Otherwise, it just Jillian, becomes negotiations. If I could add in, I actually had a really interesting conversation with one of the activists from the Philippines who had been at one of the protests and then was at one of the hotels where they had this little sort of climate center for uh, activists. And then I ran into him outside the big mosque. And um, I asked him, you know, I've never been to one of these. What, how does this compare for you from as an activist? And he said, you know, one of the really ironic things is because in Egypt, no protest was allowed outside of, of the COP. Um, the fact that they were right where you entered uh, once you got your pass, he's like, you know, President Biden walked right by us. Uh, you know, every negotiator saw us, which in, in, in times past, we were way off, even though we were bigger in number, we were less visible to, to the establishment. And it was just an interesting observation that, oh, that's kind of cool that, you know, they, they got to be inside, although they were very small. So. They, they've, they've been inside for many years, since COP21 since COP or okay. earlier even. Yeah, and in Madrid, it was the same way. Um, in Madrid, you had to walk past all the protesters. Um, and that okay. was, again, somewhat deliberate. So. Same thing with Copenhagen and COP15. You had to walk through the entrance hall to get to the plenary places. So the UN has allowed protests inside the facilities um, and, and I think that's where this sort of, what, what's the term they use, like a creative tension is so needed. You need those protests inside the facility. I, I really think you do. You, you need everybody to see them. Um, otherwise, if they're outside, then they are under the control of the government. And Poland was actually one of the worst ones to forbid any um, outside protests whatsoever, more so than Egypt. And it's interesting that we don't pick on Poland. Germany also did something similar so they couldn't have any protests near the facility. You could only have them someplace else outside. And only Madrid really allowed the youth protest to take place throughout the city uh, without a whole, the, the Greta Thunberg organized without a whole lot of um, interruption. So it, it, it's interesting because it varies from country to country. And the longer you go to these things, the longer you see, the more you see these variations. And it just reminds you it's on a world stage. But just my strong comment back to Phoebe is, man, those protests are so needed. They have to be inside. Otherwise, the negotiators end up in little bubbles. And we need mm. to see them all. You know, and that, that's, I, I fear that we push too so far. Were you, that, go ahead. Were you able to get students to stay and listen to the protesters? Because I could not. We, yeah, I, we had some. I, 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 so interestingly enough, our university was a bit of a problem here. Um, it, it, both as an able, it, well, it was actually an enabler in some ways. They could go to protests inside the venue only. If a protest took place outside the I, venue, our risk management said you may not attend. So but, our students participated in all the protests inside the venue that were authorized. So I, I mean, when I didn't really see any. Uh, maybe we were there at a different time. I, you know, I, I did not see many, many young people around. It was, you know, a lot, most of the protesters, uh, based on their stories and their placards, were speaking from the global south, were uh, testifying to their own experiences, and there were very few onlookers. Uh, at least in the second week. So there were, yeah, and it depends, there were protests on the stairs were slightly bigger, right by the tunnel in the back end of the cop, those were bigger, um, the indigenous peoples protests went on both weeks. So it, it varied week from week. And that's the thing about being there both weeks, you see ups and downs and backs and forths. And um, so I, I, I think the, 
the largest protest I've seen inside the COP was Greta Thunberg's, uh, where she got all the youth, which is actually was a lot of fun, to sit down in front of the security zone. And and the UN security were aware of it. That's the trick. You need to make sure they're aware of it. Otherwise, you lose your badge. And then the university loses its badge. Um, but there mm. were thousands of people who simply sat down. Um, and they wanted youth voice to be heard. It was very effective. Peaceful protesting. I mean, it was very, very effective. Right. They had signs that so forth, and all they did was sit, sit down. And so the delegates had to weave their way in between all these students sitting down. They weren't allowed to lie down. They were, the guards are very clear. You can just sit. Um, but there were thousands of people. It was it was awesome. It was really awesome because nice. it gave everybody, you could just go and sit down with them you know, and show your support. Um, but that that was cool. Yeah. So I've seen, I think I've seen a, a, a variety. Where it gets messy is when, um, and the women's group did that one year, ran a protest and blocked the entrance to a plenary without permission, and a bunch of people lost their badges. So the UN is not mess, messing around. As I tell my students, don't mess with the UN guards because your university will lose its badge authority. And the UN has a long memory. And it will <laughs> impact you the following year. You will not be able to bring students the following year. Yeah, this is fascinating just to, to, to hear some of your stories. Let, let's make sure, since we're, we're almost out of time here, um, Stephanie or, or Nick, do you have any questions or comments? Nick, you've just unmuted, so go ahead, Nick. Oh, th thanks. I had a logistics question. I uh, think Angie Seth once described to me the process of obtaining badges for a, a large student group, and I'm just curious how that, do all universities do that the same? Plus, I was I have no idea how many students from other countries, what percentage of the 50,000 are are students? And I guess basically who, who gets to go among students? Um, those are my questions. So I guess I can answer having been teaching this for a while. So badges are issued to um, observer organizations or someone that has uh, what's called focal status. So University of Connecticut, Colorado State, of the university, you have to apply for it and it has to go through your presidential level. So it goes pretty high up. They're not necessarily easy to get. Um, it takes a while to get, it's about a year. Vanderbilt just got theirs. So you have to apply for it. And then you're given a quota. And to give you an example of these quotas, Colorado State got four badges. Mm -hmm. This is not uncommon, four for each week. So we can get it to eight. We can split a badge one week, two weeks. I don't know how many Connecticut got. I think you guys got five or six. This is the common number for an entire university. So the badges become this sort of golden currency that is switched around. And it's not just university, it's any observer organization. There are nine constituency groups and each of those groups uh, works to help organize groups. So we're all part of the RINGO, the Research and Independent Non-NGO, but there's also the, the Indigenous Peoples NGO, there is a youth group that's focused on advocacy called the Young Goats, a youth um, non-governmental organization. They all have cool names like Bingo, Bingo, Young Go. Um, yeah. so the UN acronyms at their finest. Um, but it is a process and they use that process to balance. So there are 9,000 observers were at COP27 of the 50,000. Um, and they will also tell you which parties had the largest number of observers as a party badge. Um, and the U.S. was not the largest, and actually even a developing country was not, a developed country was not the largest. I, I had that name in my head a second ago. But they, they, they will tell you, you can actually look it up online, how many U.N. observers came, which countries did they come from, what badges did they wear, and how long were they there. So it's important to keep that in mind that you have 9,000 observers. Um, out of 50,000. So who is everybody else? It's it's quite a mix. And it's important to remember that goes back to it's a negotiation first and foremost, and the exports has become secondary, which is why there's a constant push to increase observer representation at the COP, which means the COP is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And this becomes a security issue. So the number one complaint you hear from students is they couldn't get access to rooms. The number one reason you couldn't get access to rooms because the rooms are too small, hmm. um, you know. And finding a country that has a facility that can host fifty thousand people at one time is pretty limited, and that's with a lot of temporary buildings. But the contrast, I'll just say that the end point is that, from my perspective, 
my students need to see a multicultural space in action. They need to be embedded in a room where they are the minority for the first time in their lives. I never thought about what an African nation thinks about or never thought okay. about that. And this is so important. That for me is the major teaching and you need to see that perspective that the US is one of a lot of countries. The African Union is pretty strong. They talk you know, a lot in terms of how they get to consensus. But I think it's also being where the bias, and so one last quick point, um, you know, we talk about colonialism and I think one of the fascinating things is Indigenous Peoples Day, as Phoebe pointed out, entirely, you know, highlighted Latin American Indigenous people. We are sitting in the country of Egypt, which has the <laughs> oldest Indigenous population on this planet, and they were not at the table. That's our bias. <laughs> That is our bias. The prince, one of the negotiators from Saudi Arabia asked the indigenous people group, am I not indigenous? My people have been on this speck of earth in the same place for 3000 years. Why am I not indigenous? Fascinating. It's just a question that we bring that lens with us. And until we see it in that multicultural space, we may not realize just all the bits and pieces that we're bringing in with us that may not work the same way in the global stage. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, well thank, thank you both. Uh, we, we do need to uh, cut it off uh, um, because it, it, it's been an hour. And actually, uh, I'm going to, for the first time in, I don't know, since COVID, go to Vampton downtown DC tomorrow morning to uh, listen to uh, John Kerry and, and uh, Mitt Romney at a, a special event uh, organized by the Washington Post. So this is great context for me to, to think about when I listen to them tomorrow. Um, so, so thank you, uh, Phoebe and, and Gillian. Um, thank you, Nick and, and uh, Stephanie for uh, staying with us. And even do you want to have any uh, closing remarks here? No, just it was really interesting to get the 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 sort of color and, and report back and um, you know thanks for you know sort of that 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 mass of fifty thousand people um, are not only networking but as you say I mean in some way driving the the delegates I mean I just my own sense about it is that the UN process seems to have run out of steam after Paris um, so. Uh, it's not quite sure where all that pressure, I mean, we did get in a sort of a official agreement about loss and damage, but it's pretty toothless. So um, better than nothing, I suppose. Um, but it, 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 it's interesting, you know, and, and I, I think it's really incumbent on that civil society energy to go back to the state and city level and sort of drive change. So in my mind, it's like bring all those people together to get inspired and go back and not worry too much about what the UN is doing. Um, but it may be in other parts of the world, it's more important, but you know, really engaging in communities and that's what people do. So thank you. Um, uh, that's what we're trying I, to do just, as well. I, yeah, go ahead, chat, yeah. I put in the chat a PDF version of Less is More. Excellent book. Yeah, thank great. Thank, thank you very much. and. Uh, we will share those items um, with, and, and if you have other links uh, that uh, we'll, we'll share them with everybody who's registered for both of the, the webinars today. Great, well, thank you very much. Yeah, it was a great conversation, thank you. Good night. Thank you guys, good night. Thank yeah, you. Good night, bye-bye. Thank Goodbye. you.